back. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get started with our fireside chat for today. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, for today's topic, we're going to be chatting about how is RevOps intelligence changing in 2022? It's a really good time, uh, topic for this time of the year. And we have a really great panel here today who can dive into all the different angles that are important in answering that question. So what we'll do is start with brief introductions. And then since we only have 30 minutes, we'll dive straight into questions from there. For the introductions, I'll just ask our panelists here to tell us really briefly who you are, what you do now, and a little sound bite on your connection to the topic of RevOps intelligence. So we'll start with Caroline and then James, Siobhan, and finish up with Tyler. Go ahead, Caroline. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Caroline Tansfelding. What am I doing now? Uh, I don't know, that, that, that could be answered in a number of ways, but I guess my title is the Chief Marketing Officer for Aptology, uh, and we help people understand people at work uh, and optimize against that. Um, my career spans B2C and B2B, started in sales and then went into marketing and then product and then all the way back into marketing. So that's my little tour of Caroline in like five seconds. Awesome. And what would your sound bite be on your connection to RevOps intelligence? Like if you had to put that I mean, I started talking about revol reverse funnel analysis in 2009. So we could be here for the next five hours. So just fair warning. I'm really passionate about understanding what works for the business. Awesome. And I'm really excited by my fellow panelists, including Siobhan <laughs> here. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Caroline. And then James. Yeah, so James Hemberg, I'm the Senior Director of Revenue Operations at Mediafly. Um, so we are um, a presentation software that sales reps use in every meeting that they go into, looking at content engagement, how content's being used and tying content back to revenue. Um, so very much sit within the revenue intelligence space. Um, and um, my focus currently in Mediafly is really the alignment across the go-to market teams as it relates to the buyer's journey and keeping everyone accountable for revenue. Excellent, thank you. Siobhan? Hi, I'm Siobhan Thatcher. I'm the VP of Digital Learning and Enablement at Ring Central. Uh, my purview is pretty much uh, supporting the whole go-to-market effort when it comes to enablement and training within the organization both for employees, customers, and partners. And when it comes to my link to RevOps, it is uh, a lot of the work we do is, is fully in support of the revenue operations of the organization. Excellent, thank you so much. And Tyler. Uh, I'm Tyler Simons and I head customer success at Fullcast. And for those of you that don't know, Fullcast is a go-to-market RevOps platform. So we got from territory planning all the way to execution. And so that ties really closely back into our uh, topic today, which is revenue intelligence. So we work with all of our customers on that stuff regularly. Excellent. Great. Thank you. So um, quick note for folks who are tuning in, feel free to type questions if you have them for the panel um, into the Q&A box, and we'll make sure that we leave time to, to get to those at the end, if not throughout the talk. Um, and at this point, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Tyler, who's going to be facilitating the conversation today. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. I'm, I'm moderating. <laughs> the, uh, so we're going to start with just the, the very, very broad question. And I, I think it would be interesting to hear um, a one or two sentence bit from each of our um, panelists today. So what is revenue intelligence in your own words? And um, how do you think it's changing? We can start with James. I'll, I'll throw it out there, put him sure. on the spot. So to me, um, revenue intelligence is focusing on the data and insights to create the most consistent experience across the buying journey. So across all the go-to market teams, everyone that touches it, uh, the buyer, ensuring that um, they have the most relevant insights at the point of decision um, when they're thinking about how to interact and what to do next with, in terms of engaging the buyer. Interesting. Uh, Caroline. I mean, I think it's changed quite a bit and it's changing, you know, I think it started with sales tech almost, right? Give me, what are the pieces to give me, understand territory, understand pipeline, understand deal velocity. And it's changed into full cycle 
full buyer journey understanding and optimization, which is such a broad term and it covers pre-pipe, you know, the entire experience of buying and even in customer service, when you think about land and expands, which, you know, there's two ways of making more money, right? You're getting more customers, you're getting more money from the same customers. And that second half is really blooming as well in terms of understanding how you can optimize the buyer journey after the purchase for expansions, either inside, um, so inside the company, or through referrals and really empowering. So there's a, an entire world of ref tech that goes into helping us understand what's going on where. Um, and I think that's really going to be impactful for 2022 as these teams are, their scope is just exploding. Great, right, thank you. Uh, Siobhan, you're up. <laughs> yeah, so when I think about it, um, if you look at it to use uh, uh, some analogies, you've got microscopes, you've got telescopes, and then you've got binoculars. In the past, we've had microscopes where we're zooming in on the data and not really paying attention to everything that's out there and letting the data drive it. And that worked up until the point when we no longer had the same kind of contact that we've had with our customers that we have in the past. On the telescope side of it, it is we're going to predict out there what does it look like way out without again looking at what's happening in the present. And we have found and we found very quickly that predictions don't always work, especially when the world changes. And so that's been that's been difficult to manage as well. But where we are right now is, is in the binocular stage, which is we can kind of see up close, but we can kind of see far away and we're right, not too far, not too close, but really focusing on, on what's going by and really on the customer journey. Uh, we used to sell, now we teach people and we, we are working with people on how to buy. It's a very different type of conversation. And didn't you say telescope? So is that kind of yeah. where we're all headed? Well, the telescope or is more, it's more of the strategic view. It's looking out far, okay. far into the future. The problem is, as we've discovered pretty abruptly in the last 20 months, that looking out into the future, it can change in a matter of moments. And so yeah. relying just on a telescope to see and predicting where we're going to be, at, as well as relying just on the microscope on the data, isn't enough. You've got to actually lift your head up and look around and see what's going on. It's much more about the customer journey in my mind than it ever has been. Would you say that it's like almost, you almost have to do like all three, right? You have to like take a look at all the microscope. All three are part and then, of it, right? Yeah, you have yeah. to be okay. able to predict Right. But it's it's really different, interesting views. And from from what, what what I do on my team with the enablement side of the business, we're much more at the binocular stage. We don't we're not diving deep down into the data, which is something that, you know, traditionally ops people do. And we're not predicting the future because we've seen it change way too often. We're dealing very much in the present. Um, so, Caroline. I read something. <laughs> Uh, uh, you wrote something about a year or so ago, it, you coined this term called B2Me, yeah. and it's kind of really talked a little bit about personalization and uh, being like really hyper-personalized for prospects and customers. And as we're kind of talking through this revenue intelligence topic, I'm just curious how the two, like how revenue intelligence can actually help you move towards this B2Me model, which is like essentially this hyper-personalization. Yeah, I think there's a general change in, in the B2B world. You know, there used to be this separation, I think we called, you know, between Sunday night and Monday morning, this assumption that you're a different person when you're at home than you're at work. And certainly we've treated B2B selling very different from B2C. You know, I come from the B2C world where everything is hyper-personalized and instant and gotten more and more instant. It started kind of fast, you know, when you go into a store and have a shopping experience, but it's gotten extremely you know, like accelerated, you can buy something on your phone instantly. Uh, and when I say something, it could be so many things, services, people, things, um, even digital goods that are just vaporware essentially are being bought instantly. And I think there was a lag in the B2B world where you do have buying committees and you do have longer sales cycles, but they're still treated like you still use facsimiles, you know? Um, long delays and like you emit something and something else comes out on the other side and someone picks it up. Um, and that's really changing. Um, I think there's an understanding. I know people are going to be like, the marketing person is saying there's like no one to many what is happening here. Like, welcome to this fireside job. Right it is here. music, music to my ears. I, I think this long, <laughs> like, I used to sit in the AE seat and I'm like, ah, this is just, I feel like it's not personalized and 
um yeah so yeah i mean it used to be very i mean the, the number one basic thing is you don't want it to make it all about the company right and like just yeah. just selling features that's pretty basic but getting to a point where you get to be to me which is why me as a person why now why in this position why in this context the ability to answer these questions is i think what sales marketing operations are expected to answer efficiently so that's being disrupted you know the the idea that your monday sunday night to monday morning uh, separation longer exists uh, if you're somebody who thinks of yourself as like moving fast and like you travel a lot or your life has, has been impacted in the last 20 months, it absolutely has changed how we've worked. And ignoring that kind of means the death of you as a business. So the big trends on B2Me are like, it really changes the focus. If, if you go from company centric to personalized buyer, like single buyer person centric, the way you organize things around it, the buyer journey completely changes, right? If you think of it as a circle. Like, you know, where you had business to business, like this business to this business and the interactions and the ROI calculators, which you still need to have. But like, why me? Why now? And how do I buy myself? Um, you know, I think you touched on that where the buyer wants to be in control. I think we now are used to it. We're used to having that instant control. I want to educate myself. I want to be able to see the options and I want to do it in my own pace. And so that's where you see things like Mediafly where you get that intel intelligence on if your entire workforce, sales, marketing, right, is trying to get these answers to your customers, why this solution, why you should consider it, what is, um, you know, what are your options and why is this one in your consideration? How do you know who's looking at what, right? Like, and when, and if you don't, then you're not answering the right question to be helpful to the buyer on whether or not you're a fit. And on our side, you know, I, I'm like, I'll point to Siobhan and her ABC, there's also this complete shift on the inside on how you look at people, the sellers, um, to be able to achieve B2Me, right? What does it mean to have a workforce that has that buyer-centric journey? So reorganization on the product side, on the engineering side, on the marketing side, on the sales side, how do you re like change that mindset and how do you empower them with the knowledge to make that possible. It's not trivial. You don't just wake up one morning and be like, oh, we're gonna be buyer-centric today. How do you do that? Um, so I think there's there's a really big trend on getting that instant gratification and answering the right question at the right time for the right per person, answering why me. And I think RevOps in 2022 is all gonna be about that. It's going to be about on how do we get the company there from a tech perspective, from a people perspective, um, from a content perspective, it's, it's really, it's a 360 change, um, to be able to achieve that. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot in there. We had a mention of ABCs, which we'll come, we're going to come back to, I'm going to put a tiny pin in that, uh, cause I don't want James to be too quiet for the whole, the whole conversation. And I'm actually just curious, James, from your perspective, you know, Caroline talked a little bit about tech stack and, uh, you know, how that ties into revenue intelligence. So I was curious to hear from your perspective, what you're seeing change there and um, any insights, like let's, let's start there. And then I, if there's a good follow-up question, I'll, I'll uh, jump in there. Sure. Yeah, no. Um, so historically, you know, if you think about revenue ops and it's tech stack, it really starts with CRM and that's where you buy all these different pieces uh, within the tech stack that align to the buyer's journey and, a lot of it's just being fed back into the CRM as the place to aggregate all the data and keep all the data in one place. Um, so what CRM is really becoming, at least in, in my opinion, is just a collection of all the data. It's, a, it's instead of a you know customer relationship management database, it's, it's just a customer database of all that information. And so what revenue intelligence platforms are trying to do is then pull all of that information into a much more usable platform that's a, delivering that insights to the reps at the point of decision. So giving them that binoculars look into what they're into the data. Um, so they're not looking at it at a very granular level, but they're looking at it at the right level to help them make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's what I think the best uh, revenue intelligence platforms are allowing their, their reps to do. And I agree with Caroline that it's going to be such a focus on enabling the reps through that technology to be able to pick what the next best action is going to be based off of where the buyer's at currently in their journey. So are these things that are just sitting on top of like the CRM that's kind of just reading the data and going, hey, now's a good time to do 
X and then a little bit later, now's a great time to do Y, so on and so forth. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And so the key is making sure that you have all those things talking with one another. So when anybody looks at it, at any part of the buyer's journey, they get the, as much of a full picture as possible. So I think you're seeing companies like Outreach by companies like Canopy or uh, Zoom Info by Chorus. They're trying to build this database of information on the single platform so that you can get the most holistic look possible whenever regardless of where you're sitting uh, in that circle that's, that's becoming the buyer's journey. Makes sense. Um, ABCs, let's come, let's full circle it. So tell me a little bit about these ABCs and how you think that ties back into the revenue intelligence. So uh, who on this has never seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, right? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a horrid movie, but everybody in sales has seen it. And the ABCs was always, always be closing, right? What have you done for me lately? What have you done for me lately? And that's what we focused on when it came to our sellers and the data around the sellers. Instead, the approach that we've been taking is much more the ABCs where we've renamed them into what are the attitudes you're bringing to the table when you're speaking with your customers? What are the behaviors you're exhibiting in order to support the customers in what they're doing? And what are the competencies you have and that you don't have that we need to be able to fix and, and fill that gap so that you really are focused on the customers. In my team, we encompass the whole customer journey from the beginning through the end, because I've got, I've got customer trainings under me, all the partner stuff, all the employees, everything. So if there is an issue with a customer, no matter where it is on my team, all of us swarm to that issue to say, what is it? Where is it in the customer's journey that it's occurring, right? The experience. Where is the gap? What are the insights that we've discovered? How are we going to fix it? What's an initiative we can do to fix that? And then how are we going to measure it? What's the impact? And by doing that, my team at Ring Central, probably more than any other team at Ring Central, has a holistic view of the customer through their whole journey, from the time they come on through their whole journey until they retire or whatever it is that they do. So it's that this is where the, the revenue is impacted, is looking at the customer as the customer, as opposed to trying to sell to them, trying to help them solve the problems that they have by bringing everything you can to the table. How do you, <laughs> this, is, this is a dumb question. How do you begin to understand that? Like, how do you, you know, where do you start? You start at the beginning, right? And which sounds ridiculous, <laughs> but no, you start with the conversations, right? You start by speaking with your sellers, right? That feedback yeah. loop is critical. You have to have it. We have driven the feedback loop from the moment we started sales enablement here five years ago. We have driven that feedback loop to say, get out there with your sellers, ask them what's happening, what's working, what's not. Because marketing has a view and marketing can see so far deep, but marketing also makes the assumption that those, these folks are actually searching in some way, right? How do you tickle them to get them to search? How do you find out what are the challenges that are out there so you can go out to somebody who may not be searching and explain to them why they should? right? Here's what you should be searching for. Here's the things you should be looking at. And so it's that feedback loop. And it's not just from the sellers, it's from the managers as well, from a coaching perspective. Where are the gaps in your sellers? Where are they not meeting the customer's expectations? Where are the customers leaving us? Are they churning? Are they just not, you know, are they coming so far down the journey? And then all of a sudden they're going, yeah, we're out. Why? Mm -hmm. What's happening there? And unless you have a feedback loop discovered, and, and real feet on the treat and feet on the street and the more um, nebulous type of answers that sometimes you can't get in the data. You need that feedback loop to fill that in. I always feel like feedback loops are the most underappreciated thing. I don't know. I, I, like say, everyone... I think that's the theme of 2022, right? From data yeah. to feedback to loop. It. There's no intelligence without a feedback loop, right? There just isn't. Yeah. If you know something, you never learn on what comes back. I mean, that's the right. definition of insanity, right? Doing different things, the same thing and expecting a different result. In 2020, we now become insane. Maybe that's our, our tagline. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> uh, the, the, the hard part about it, though, is that there's just, I think there's just so much to do, right? That's kind of where I, that question's coming from in terms of like, where do you really start? Because there's so many things that you, so many little levers that you can pull and understand, okay, how does this impact that and so on and so forth, that then you forget about the feedback loops because it's, it's, a, a side thing, even though it's probably one of the most important things. 
the simple way is just to go out to the selling leadership and ask them where they see the gaps, yeah. right? You did not make your number, Mr. Sales Leader. Why do you think that is in this quarter? You made your number last quarter. Why didn't you this quarter? What is the gap? The and economy. then work with them, right? Work with them to find out. Look at your CSATs, right? Talk to your CS. The customer success teams have, have all of a sudden got a much, much more stronger and prevalent position within organizations because we don't have the ability to go out and take people golfing and dinners and all of the traditional stuff we've done to hold them, right? Because it can be fun. We don't have that anymore. So you have to find out what is it that this two-dimensional environment that we're in mm -hmm. what is it that breaks through the noise and helps you not only gain the customers but retain them as well what do you think james in terms of like where where do you start from like maybe a tech stack perspective like if i'm looking at this whole thing and i'm needing to i i'm used to doing my b2b non-personalized I'm just going to scale this thing and go crazy to I'm realizing that I've got a problem and I need to solve it. And I, <laughs> and where do I, where do I start? And is it start with a tech, like some kind of tool, or is it just a mindset shift? I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are there. So I always start in the same place and that's with the data. Um, so look at the data and understand um, what are you measuring? Cause you can't create a feedback loop on something that you can't measure. Um, so you need to be able to measure it first. And, you know, to Siobhan's point, like a lot of that is dictated by the input on the conversations you're having with the business on where they believe you should be measuring and what the focus is. So when prioritizing where you're investing in your tech stack, that's a great place to start. If you're not measuring it today, get something that can. Um, and then from there, um, measure it and then understand it through the feedback loop. Cause once you can measure and understand it, you can control it and you can improve it. Um, and so that's kind of the key steps that I always take when I'm looking at it. Um, so when I'm thinking about where to invest in my tech stack moving forward, you know, I really want to understand what the needs across the go-to market teams are. Um, most of what I do every day isn't major changes. It's small tweaks to processes based off of that feedback loop they could have big results. Um, but once I see a huge gap and I know that there's nothing I have in place today, that's when I'll start thinking about potentially investing in a new piece of technology. I'm gonna put you in a spot. Could you, could you, <laughs> could you give me an example of something like a, a small tweak that you might make that you're like, hey, I'm working in this project and I need yeah. to make this tweak here. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that, that we're working on internally is actually thinking of uh, rethinking about our methodology. So it, it's not a, a small tweak, I would say, but implementing a methodology, um, specifically like MedPIC. Um, reps are pretty much doing a lot of these things today, but formalizing it and holding people accountable to it and implementing it in there. Um, and then understanding through MedPIC, what are the things that we're not getting information on today as a result of the sales cycle, um, whether that's the metrics that we have. And so um, when you're trying to think about metrics, it's then thinking about your customers and how are you measuring your customers and how are they measuring you in terms of how they're successful with your platform as well too. So by just putting in a little bit of standardization and thinking about it that way, um, it's a small change for our reps again, because it's something that they were already doing, but formalizing it and putting it in a, a process both makes it scalable, but also really helps us identify where are those gaps, are we measuring them correctly and, and how can we measure them better moving forward? It's beautiful. What about ROI? So, you know, how do we measure the ROI of these tools or I don't even know if it needs to be tools. It could just be, how do we measure the ROI of any kind of revenue intelligence related activity that we're doing? So that could be the feedback loops that we're talking about. This could be this movement of the moving towards B to me, like getting more personalized and not scaling up. And it could be a tool thing. So I'd be curious to hear from everybody. Maybe we'll start with uh, Siobhan on uh, ROI and um, how do we measure it and where, where would somebody start there? So on my side of the business, ROI is measured by increasing productivity and reduction in attrition, whether that's internal folks or it's customers. So that's really how we measure it. 
the um, I mean, Ring Central themselves, we've got over 200 different levers that are used to measure the data of which I don't get involved with most of, <laughs> most of it. But from the enablement side of it, it's just those two pieces, right? This is what my CRO cares about, is, is, pro is productivity going up and attrition going down. And so when the conversations I have are with him, that's what we talk about. When I'm going down lower down the level, we get down to the first line managers and get down to the feet on the street. It's much more about have they taken this particular training? Do we have the uh, the empathy? Because something I've discovered is that data doesn't drive empathy, but empathy can change the data. And so it's that empathy in 2022 that's really it's it's the knowledge of of not only how to exhibit empathy and actually use it, but how that empathetic approach will help change the revenue numbers. And so that's kind of what we've been working on is, have we been doing the coaching? Like for example, in February, we had a million minutes of video and learning done in the month of February alone across 2000 learners. I mean, those numbers are off the scale, but it's because at that time we needed them to be able to understand that it was a different approach, right? These, this is how the messaging has changed. This is how you need to be able to work with your customers. So it was data-driven, no doubt about it. And the ROI was the fact that at the end of February, as I said, we had 1 million minutes worth of learning had occurred across a very small group of individuals. So we know that from the repetition of it and all the learning curve, these are the things I talk about at that level, but it depends on where it is on the chain that I'm talking to folks where the ROI will be different. But ultimately right. it's performance going up, attrition going down. It's a piece of cake. Yeah, um, simple. <laughs> Simple's hard. Yeah. It's super simple. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Caroline, how about, how about you? Well, you know, I think, uh, I think we all want to be very numbers driven. Return on investment is, you know, what are you investing in? What's your return on it? I think that as buyers ourselves, we're probably going to be more methodical and more, I mean, we're going to have higher standards for what our tools can do for us, right? Because we have to, to execute on B2Me, you need to have prospect intelligence. You need to have a tech stack that currently, I, we can dive into that in just a second. And then you need your own people side, right? You need the people on your side to be able to execute. And there's been a huge strain on your own people and trying to get that qualitative. I think there's a lot of qualitative that's starting to move to quantitative. And I think the tools are starting to be smarter, right? It used to be that you know, in your, in your curve of maturity, um, when you think about RevOps, it was about collecting data at first because you had so little of it. Uh, either that's about your sellers, right? And your team or your prospects, you had very limited visibility uh, or in, you know, how they move through the cycle. You know, you might have like signals here and there. And I think the tech stack is really evolving to help serve the business um, there. And what I mean by that is you have tools like um, before I would in marketing issue, let's say some pieces of collateral, right? And it would be qualitative. It'd be driven by a bunch of customer interviews and then we'd interpret them and then we'd make them into collateral and then we'd put that on the web and then you kind of hope that something comes out of it, right? And now you have tools like Mediafly where you empower your sellers with it and you understand who's interacting with it at what point of the discussion, what's how far they're actually getting into it and whether or not they go and do something else. So it's that feedback loop is included in the tech stack, that intelligence, to save all of that work and to answer what actually moves things along. Um, or you have things like, let's say, a chorus where you can actually record the calls. And in marketing, instead of like doing these interviews, you know, like how people are, say things differently when they're observed. Well, you have that live interaction with the seller and the buyer. I can use the specific wording from the prospect and answer those questions in the way that they ask them. I mean, that is worth an insane amount right, to be able to do that. And on our side, Autology, we help decodify, you know, codify behavior to Siobhan's point. Like you could do all these interviews one by one, but like on a 2000 seller unit, that's an insane amount of effort away from the prospects to do that. So is there a way to understand the behaviors that drive and close the loop on performance, right? How do you close the loop on performance within the tech stack? So what you can then do is make spend your time actioning that intelligence. I mean, I, that's probably marketing speak. And we're like, eh. but you know, like how do I make that piece of collateral? How do I put it in the right spot? How do I give it to the right person at the right time? I think we're going to have a higher bar for tech in 2022 to make RevOps truly Rev intelligence and not just operations, just not just collecting and asking people to really ha have to 
become these Excel gurus everywhere, right? In all these different formats. Long-winded answer, but that's, it, it almost that's comes. It kind of it kind of comes back to productivity again. You know, you think about it like there's an aspect of this. Like all these tools are really helping people um, understand the the buyer, the prospect, the customer. Uh, in what they want and how they want it and what they want to do. And it really gets right down to the point where they can then tailor things quickly rather than uh, maybe take guesses at, <laughs> at what somebody wants. Um, so I know, I think we're at 1230, right? I was hoping, do we have a couple extra minutes here? Uh, the timekeeper, Ashley here. Uh, so James, what about you on your end? Uh, and ROI as it relates to uh, the tech stack and revenue intelligence. And those are both really good answers. So I'll try to add to them. Um, but I think, you know, to their points, like a good technology when you're investing in it, will have the reporting within it to give you the, that, that answer, right? It should tell you the ROI and the impact that you're having on your business. But doing the initial investment, right? There's always a pain that you're addressing, that you're thinking about the gaps that you're trying to measure. And then how do you quantify that through metrics that you're already measuring as it impacts the business? So how is this going to impact my win rate? How is it going to impact my average selling time or uh, you know, the average sale time or average selling price, that type of thing. Um, so always think about the things that you're already measuring and how is this tech stack going to enhance those? Because we already know that these are important to the business and that gives me that baseline of improvement that I need to measure it against over the, the contract term. Um, so that's usually how I think about it, but most of the best or the best, you know, revenue intelligence technologies that I've seen will give you a lot of that information as it ingests the data and as you're using it. Ah, thank you. So I think we have just enough time for closing remarks. Um, does anybody else want to add anything to our topic today that you want to like a little, little uh, take home bag for our, uh, our guests? <laughs> Well, I think what's pretty clear is that it doesn't matter what viewpoint you're coming in it, that you're coming in from, we all have to work together to make it work. Revenue ops affects every part of the organization, not just a traditional ops role. Everybody needs to be involved in order to, to turn the dial. Yeah. Yeah, I think just to, to add to that, it just, it all goes back to the buyer's journey. And I think that that's the reason why it's all connected because it all connects back to that. Caroline? I mean, let's go from data to feedback, right? To get to intelligence. I mean, luck to everybody out there who's trying to achieve that, uh, but keep focus and really try to tie it back together. And I think you'll be really ahead of the game. Awesome. Thank you all three of you for coming on today. This was actually really fun. Um, it's really interesting to hear the different perspectives from um, each and every one of our panelists today. So thank you again. And thanks for everybody that's out there listening and joining us. Ashley? That's all. Thank you. I will send the recording out to everybody who signed up to make sure that you can review this later. And thank you so much, Siobhan, James, and Caroline for making time to talk with us. Really great conversation. Thank you. It was yep. a pleasure. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Take yep. care. Have a good one. Bye-bye.